Hello, dear friends. Thank you for joining us here on our worship service hour. I am Pastor David Salazar, and I am delighted that I can spend this time of studying, of understanding the scriptures with you, and I thank you for really tuning in to our program. I want to wish you a very happy Sabbath, and obviously we want to start today's presentation, studying God's word with a prayer, asking the Lord to lead us into all truth, to ask the Holy Spirit to use me so that I may present the words of the Lord to you. And I want to invite you to borrow your heads with me as we start this presentation with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you at this hour, we humbly ask that you will send your Holy Spirit to come into our minds, to come into my heart, to be able to be used by you to present the truth to your people, to those that are watching, those that are listening to this presentation, to this sermon. I pray, Lord, that you will give us an abundant blessing today as we open your word. And once again, may the honor and the glory be to your name is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you today to study with me a little bit more about Revelation. We are certainly interested in knowing what Revelation, the book of Revelation, represents or reveals to us in the experience of God's people, God's remnant church. And we have been studying for this past few uh, months a little bit about Revelation, and today we're going to ent enter or present to you why is the Lord telling us in that beautiful book about the seven churches of God's chosen people? Why is the Lord entering or starting the book of Revelation with the messages to seven churches. And why is those messages or those messages are important for us as we are part of God's remnant church? So I want to invite you as we go into the book of Revelation to go and open in chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. We're going to read from the Word of God two verses that Christ sort of tells us is important for us to pay attention to and to listen. It says there, the Lord speaking there to John, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Notice here how the Lord starts explaining or sort of declaring to John that the study of Revelation, the beginning of Revelation, is in regards to the seven churches. And he actually tells John that the things that he's going to see, the things that he's going to hear, he needs to write them and he is going to send these messages to those churches. Now, we obviously don't have at this time the uh, time to really go into depth into all the verses, what every single thing entails in regards to what is found in these verses. This is for an in-depth revelation study, and here in Secrets and Sealed, we have, by the grace of God, material that can really help you go over every single verse, every single uh, concept and symbol that is presented in the book of Revelation. But today I want to really give you an overview of what really will be the element, the key for us to understand as God's end time church, as God's remnant church, what is the key in Revelation, in the messages to the seven churches that will give us success or victory. We want to have victory. We want to have or be part of a movement of a church that succeeds in following and fulfilling God's mission. So it is important for us to know how the Lord wants us to understand and really apply what we read in Revelation in regards to the seven churches. And this is why, before we actually discuss the seven churches and the messages that are found there, I want to present from, from the Word of God today a link, a a way that the Lord wants us to see why he speaks of seven churches, of seven candlesticks, of seven stars, of seven angels, why he uses these elements of seven so many times in the beginning of the book of Revelation, why it's important for us to pay attention to what's the Lord trying to present to us in regards 
to the experience there in the messages to seven churches. Remembering, and let's go back to the book of 1 Corinthians 10, 11, how the Lord tells us that the things that are found in the Bible in the old uh, things that are written in the Old Testament, for example, are written for our indication, for our understanding, for our example. And notice what it says there in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now, all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. We can see here, we notice that the Lord is actually telling us in his word that the things that are written in the past, the things that are written in the stories of the Bible, are actually for us living in the times of the end. And they're written for us as admonition, as instruction, as teaching us, or giving us an overview, oversight of what we are to apply as principles so that we can receive the messages in a way that really can help us understand our purpose and accept the messages as a way to receive success. And this is important because oftentimes I have found myself when I discuss and I talk with people or I share with people about revelation, a lot of times there is this resistance, if you will, by many professed Seventh-day Adventists to really not longer study the book of Revelation or to put away the book of Revelation a little bit or not really pay attention to the messages because they say, well, for example, the seven churches, it's about the history of the God's church throughout the ages. So the messages in the seven churches are really sort of like old news, if you will. I only need to emphasize in the last uh, message of Laodicea, for example. And although that's an interesting and a valid point to a certain degree, we forget that the Lord wrote the book of Revelation in its totality, not just for a particular period, but really it was given for the end time church. And we're going to notice and see why it's so important to link the stories in the Old Testament, to connect the stories in the Old Testament to the understanding of Revelation to get a real good picture, a real good idea of how the Lord wants us to see, experience, and read the book of Revelation. Not only that, there are some people who actually have studied Revelation, have studied the seven churches, and actually have said, you know, there are some messages there that I really don't like, and I don't really find the messages to be very uplifting. Some actually, some people have actually said to me that the book of the Revelation, specifically the seven churches, the messages of the seven churches, it's are messages that are not necessarily in order, that they should be applied only to those people that are really fit the description. But I believe that God wants us to understand that he does not give things or put things just randomly in there. There's a reason why he puts things in order. Another fact is that some friends have actually preached and said and have actually expressed views that the book of Revelation in the seven churches is more important to emphasize one particular message over the other putting in the minds of people, for example, that the message to Philadelphia, which is a message of hope, of love, of no reproach, that's a message that God's people need to hear and not the other. And so there are many different positions, but I believe it all comes down to misunderstanding or trying to find a way to explain, explain or express what the Lord has given without understanding why God gives us these messages in an order and why he gives us messages that are fulfilled or are connected to the end time church. So this is why we're going to go into a story that is found in the book of Joshua. We're going to go to actually see an example in the Bible where we, we actually find the same concept of seven repeated many times. You see, remember, we read in Revelation 1, 19 and 20, that we saw a verse there that describes the seven stars which he had in the right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. These seven stars are seven angels to the churches and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. This verse that we just read is a verse that actually brings the word seven four times. And interestingly enough, there is really just one 
part in the word, word of God, one story rather, that uses the word seven four times in one verse. And I don't think it's just a coincidence. It's not necessarily just because it happened to be that way. I believe the Lord in his wisdom, in his understanding, really wanted to, for us to understand a story that can really connect us to the experience for the, for the Lord, uh, for the people of God in the last days rather, that need to understand and apply to themselves. And so we're going to go to the story back that we found in Joshua chapter 5, and we're going to start there at verse 13. Now, before we go to the story, I want to tell you, this story is one story that you are very familiar with. It's a story that you have probably read several times, or like me, have heard since you were a young individual going to church who has not heard the story of Jericho and the battle of Jericho. But we're going to really analyze in the context of what God has in store for us in the light to the concept of seven repeated several times in the book of Revelation. So let's look at that story for a minute and let's start at verse 13 of chapter 5, Joshua 5, 13 through 15. It says there, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him, with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Are thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what said my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, it's important that we actually, before we look into the story of the battle of Jericho, we actually emphasize the experience of Joshua when he meets the captain of the Lord's host. Now, this captain is no angel, is not a created individual, is not a holy uh, cherubim that came and presented himself to Joshua. This is none other than Jesus himself. And we know that because only the Lord and not a single created being can actually receive the worship of a man. Notice how when Joshua understood who he was, he fell and worshiped. It says verse 14, and he worshiped, you know, he fell to his face, to his into the ground and worshiped this captain of the Lord's host. And it is the same individual, the same person that also told Moses back uh, several years ago before this incident when he saw that fire and that bush that would not quench, he came close to the bush and that voice came to him and said, do not or take away your sandals because the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. The same thing happened here and the Lord asked him to take his shoe off because he was coming before the presence of God. There was holiness and he needed to enter into an uh, experience of worship and reverence before the Lord. So we see that this is an experience of the Lord presenting himself, showing himself to Joshua. Now, in the same way, in a very similar way, the Lord presented himself to John, the revelator, in Patmos. We already went over this in the previous presentation, how the Lord came to John and showed himself, and John had to worship and serve, of course, Jesus. And it's interesting to know that when the Lord wants to share something special, when he wants to share a special message to his people, he's actually there in person telling this message. And this is one of the few messages that Christ spoke directly to people in the Old Testament. There are a few examples when Jesus had come personally to speak 
to his servants. We know the story when Jesus spoke with Abraham, when he was going to reveal to him the plans of Sodom and Gomorrah, when he spoke with Moses, of course, there in the, in the firing bush. But here we have Joshua again. He's entering, or they're about to enter, and they need directions in how to succeed conquering Canaan, especially they were facing this beautiful and big city of Jericho, the most powerful city of that whole area of Canaan. This city was not only strongly built, the walls were impressive, were huge, were impenetrable, but they also had a great army. They were able to defend themselves. They were the top of the nations, if you will, of Canaan. So they had a good army, a great city, a lot of money, a lot of weapons, and therefore Joshua understood that this battle was almost impossible to do in human strength. So he is there approaching, looking to the Lord for wisdom, for guidance, and he's coming and he meets Jesus, the captain of the host of Israel, he meets him there. He does not understand first who he was because he sees him with a, with a sword in his hand. And yet when he approaches and asks the question, he recognizes and realizes that this is the Lord himself. And so now the Lord is going to reveal to him once he is in the spirit of humility, of service, of worship, and recognizing his need of coming before the Lord, then is when Christ can share with him the plans. How are you going to overcome this city that it seems impossible to conquer? Notice what the Lord says in chapter 6 of Joshua. Now, this is, of course, important to understand that this is going to be the, the, the chapter that the Lord reveals to him what he is to do. Notice how the chapter starts and says, now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, this is the Lord, the one that we spoke or we saw that he met Joshua there. And the Lord said unto Joshua, see, I have given into thy hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. Verse 3, and ye shall come past the city, all ye men of war. And go around and go around about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And the seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. This is the verse, verse four, where we actually see the word seven four times repeated just like we found in Revelation 120, the word seven, four times repeated. But here, the, as, up to this point, we see what the Lord is telling Joshua. The Lord is telling Joshua, okay, this is how you're going to overcome the city. You need to understand that the city is going to be conquered in a way that is not ordinarily done by human hands. It's not going to be a battle of forces, of armies against armies, of soldiers against soldiers. This is a battle that the Lord will grant you victory. It's already guaranteed. However, before you can actually succeed and receive that victory, you need to do and follow precisely the instructions that I give you. You see, the Lord tells him at the beginning, you're going to have, this is, this is already a done deal, is an assured victory. But for that to happen, which is already guaranteed, you need to follow my instructions precisely and very carefully. As the Lord tells him, they were to compass the city. All the men of war, every able man of the camp of Israel who was able to go into war, they were to be part of this assault or this movement of conquest. It was not for <clears throat> those that did not want to go to war just to say, you know, I don't want to do it. Everyone had to participate. Every single person, every single man that was able to fight, 
that was able to go into war needed to be part of this. He couldn't leave the cowards and he couldn't leave those that maybe felt that they didn't want to join the army. Everybody had to be part of that. So the unity of the camp of Israel was important, was crucial, was paramount for this to succeed. The second element was that all they had to do for six days was to go around the city. All they had to do for six days was for them to go once around the city. Now, the order of how they were to go was very peculiar as well. It was not just randomly to go in a way that everybody just kind of runs around the city, no. They were to march, and the way that they would go, and we're gonna see, uh, actually verse four tells, the Lord tells him that they had to have seven priests with seven trumpets. And after the seven priests with seven trumpets, they would have the Ark of the Covenant. The priests will take the Ark of the Covenant and they will go around the city. And in the seventh day, after the six days that they did this uh, going around, this, this interesting or peculiar movement, the seventh day, they would have to do this seven times. So the way that they will put, and we're going to actually read that, in the verse 5, notice what the Lord explains or how they came into action or they actually did what the Lord told them to do. Notice, uh, uh, actually, before we go to verse 5, notice what verse 6 and 7, the Joshua tells them to do to the priest. Notice verse 6 and 7. And Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priest and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the Ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on and come past the city and let him that is armed pass on before the Ark of the Lord. So here we actually see how the Lord said those that are armed, the, the ones that have weapons, swords, the smaller group that had those elements of war, they were to go first then the priest, then the ark, and then the rest of all the army of Israel. All the men of, of war, they were to follow after this specific instruction. So we have first the men that were armed, then the priest with the trumpets, the seven priests with the trumpets, then the priest with the ark of the covenant, and then following them was the rest of the congregation of the men of war. Now, what would happen after they were to do this every day for six days, and on the seventh day, if they were to do the seven uh, rounds, if you will, what were they to do at the very end of the seventh day? Notice what it says, verse 5 of Joshua 6. And it shall come to pass, this is the Lord speaking to Joshua, and it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with a ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. So this is exactly how the Lord tells Joshua the conquest, the way that they were going to overcome. What would happen if they were to follow specific directions? At the very end of the seventh day, the seventh time they turned or they went around the city, at that last moment, after the priest will blow the horn or the trumpets for a long time, after they finish with that prolonged sound, all the men would at once shout, a shout of victory. And what would happen? What would be the result of that element, of that attack, if you will, of that following God's instructions? Well, the Lord said, the walls will fall flat. Now, this is, again, an, an, a victory that it almost seems impossible to happen. It's not humanly possible, of course. God was giving them instructions of something that it did not make human sense. Imagine if you were to actually tell a general of any army in this world that the way to conquer a city was just by following these instructions they will think that you are out of your mind. And people, those that were there, the Israelites, had to also 
forget their human reasoning, forget their ideas of what would be effective, they had to trust by faith into something that was not necessarily evident, that it seemed contrary to any common wisdom or any common knowledge. So the, the Lord required his people, God's people as a whole, to not question his methods, do not question what he presented in his instructions, not to question even Joshua, who was the chosen leader, but to follow the instructions closely. And it was imperative that they would follow the instructions so that the walls will fall down flat and they would overcome. This is why it's so important that when we look at this lesson and the story, when we actually study this, this experience of Israel, we realize that the biggest battle ever performed, the biggest victory ever performed in the history of Israel is perhaps this one. Not only because they were actually conquering. You see, in a lot of other battles in, this, in, the, in the Bible, along the stories that we have found throughout the scriptures, a lot of the battles that we've seen how God intervenes and saves God's people miraculously is usually when they are being attacked, being attacked by foreign armies. But this is one of the few instances where the Lord actually is telling them to conquer, to overcome, to have victory, to succeed in advancing. And the way to succeed, the way to advance, the way to have victory over the enemy that they need to overcome was to follow an instruction, a way of fighting that was so peculiar, so specific, and that if they follow instructions, not only they will not have to actually fight against an army, but they actually will not lose one single individual. A victory where there's no wounded, no man dead, no one left behind, where there is everyone is successful, when there is no need to even invest in weapons of mass destruction or, or, or weapons of, of any type of destruction to destroy the city. No fighting, no fire, none of that. The Lord will actually give them the victory. And after the walls were come, crumbled down, after the walls were destroyed, were laid flat, as the Bible says, they could easily enter the city, everyone, and destroy the city. They were to not take anything from the city. Nothing was for them to take. Everything that was in that city was called to be a curse. And the Lord wanted people, his people, not to touch anything. And the only elements of gold and silver they will gain was to put it in the treasury of God's tabernacle. That was the only thing that they were to receive or to use and put, not for themselves, but to the treasury of the Lord. So we know this experience, and we know that God gave them the assurance of victory. Now, what do they do? Notice what it happens, and, and let's see there in verse 9 of Joshua 6. Notice what it says there. And the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets, and the reward, re, re reward came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And verse 10, and Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout, then shall ye shout. So the ark of the Lord, verse 11, compassed the city, going about it once, and they came to the camp and lodged in the camp. And verse 12, And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord, and verse 13, and seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the real reward came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on and the blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returning to the camp, and so they did six days. So let's stop here for a minute and analyze that. What did they do? Did they follow instructions of the Lord? Did they actually follow close instructions of God? Absolutely they did. The priests and the men of war 
the ones that in front that were armed, the ones that were behind that were the rest of the army of the Israel, they were all quiet. They were not to make a sound just as they marched in order. They were to be silent. They were not to say anything, not to speak, not to murmur, not to mention a word. They were to be very silent. They were to just follow instructions and in reverence follow the trumpet of the Lord. Those seven trumpets that were sounding and as they were following the Ark of the Covenant, who was also at the, at the front of, towards the front of this procession, they were to remain in humility, in reverence, because they were not transporting just any object, any, I don't know, casual thing. They were actually transporting the Ark of the Covenant that represented the presence of God. They were actually walking with the Lord, walking in the presence of God. And as they were walking and marching around the city, they will actually start this very early in the day. There it says Joshua will rise up really early and they will do this walking or this march around the cities, around the city once a day. Every day they will wake up early to do that walk around the city. Every day they have to wake up, stand up, listen to the march or the sounds of the trumpets, follow in a, in a straight um, formation. And as they went around and finished doing a full round the city, they were to return to their tents in silence and remain there. Now, let's see what happened after they did this for six days. What happens in the seventh day that they actually did this? Verse 15 and 16, and says, And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning, the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time, when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord had given you the city. Notice how incredible this story is. They are actually there in the seventh day, the last day that they had been marching to conquer the city. They were instructed to do this walk or this march around the city, not once, but seven times. It was the only day that they had to actually walk or march around remembering or redoing what they had done in the previous six days. You see, that last day, that seventh day, they had to go over what they did on the first day, what they did in the second day, what they did in the third day, what they did in the fourth day, what they did in the fifth day, what they did in the sixth day, they were to repeat that. And then after they repeated all six march, all six rounds upon the city, they were to fulfill the last round, the seventh round. And then, and only then, could they actually shout for the victory. It is interesting that the Lord asked them to do this. Now, was the Lord just trying to wear them down, trying to make them feel tired, trying to make them, I don't know, perhaps get them uh, to complain about having to do this seven times in one day? No, what the Lord wanted them to do is to remember what they had done in each of the days that were prior to that. And that seventh day that of the battle, the seventh day of this march, this seventh day was to be special. It was a day where they will actually go over and remember, we did this once. We actually walked twice, three times. And so they had to have even more endurance and not complain, not to say a, a voice, but to continue to trust the Lord that this was the only way possible for them to have victory. So they had to actually, as they were walking or as they were marching around the city for seven times, they were to keep in mind that God had given them the assurance. And even though they started really early, at the breaking of the day, at the, at the dawning of the day, they were to 
remember that even if it might took them several hours, we don't know exactly how long it was for them to march, every single one to march around the city, but whatever, whatever time it took them, they were to continue and to be perseverant until the very end. Because as they experienced those seven turns in the city, remembering what happened in every single day, and passing that experience in that final day, God had given them the assurance of victory. So this is where it's very important for us to understand the link that this story, this wonderful story of victory, has with the book of Revelation, and specifically as we start in those seven messages to the seven churches. You see, seven is repeated several times, as we mentioned, in Revelation. And God starts the messages or the revelation of his end time events or what's going to happen to the God's people, how they're going to have victory. He doesn't start with describing the elements of the enemy, who the beast is, who the false prophet is, who is that harlot in Revelation. No, he starts with messages to his people, to his church. And God has given us a clear indication that these messages are not just to be brushed away or to think that are not necessary for us. God has given instructions that these messages are actually to be applied, to be taken by us. Certainly, the messages of the seven churches are applied to periods of time of God's church. But just like in the time or in the experience of Jericho, just like those that, were in the, that had to go in the, in the last day seven, seven times, repeating every single day or repeating what they did in every single day, in the exact same principle, God wants God's last day church, the Adventist church, the remnant church of the Lord, to actually go over every one of these messages and accept them as experiences for them so that they can actually have a complete understanding of their condition, of their need, and of how they can gain the victory. The Lord has assurance of victory, has given us the assurance that we will be successful, that God's people, God's church will be successful. But only if that church, if those that are actually in the last day, those that are part of that seventh last church, actually embrace and repeat and go over the messages that are sent by the Lord, by the faithful witness, and that we take them as personal instruction. Only then we can actually have a complete understanding. That's why seven is so important. Seven is a, a number of completeness, of perfection. Only when we take those seven messages as personal, as God talking to us, then we can actually be truly successful. The servant of the Lord tells us that these messages are for us. I want you to listen uh, to the words of God or the word of the Lord by the Spirit of Prophecy that says there in Testimonies for the Church, volume 6, page 418. She says there, this uh, speaking of the, uh, he who walked it in the midst of the seven golden, golden candlesticks. This is scripture shows Christ relation to the churches. He walks in the midst of his churches throughout the length and breadth of the earth. He watches them with intense interest to see whether they are in such a condition spiritually that they can advance his kingdom. Christ is present in every assembly of the church. He's acquaint, acquainted with everyone connected with his service. He knows those whose hearts he can fill with the holy oil that they may impart it to others. Those who faithfully carry forward the work of Christ in our world, representing in word and works the character of God, fulfilling the Lord's purpose for them, are in his sight very precious. Christ takes pleasure in them as a man takes pleasure in a well-kept garden and the fragrance of the flowers he has planted. Here she speaks of Christ as he's walking in the midst of the candlesticks, as, he's the, as, as a symbol of him walking in the midst of God's churches today, 
of God's remnant church and the churches that are part of the Adventist movement, they are actually being visited by the presence of God, of Christ himself. Just like in that experience of Jericho where the ark was with them and they had to walk along with the ark, Christ is walking in our midst, in our churches, in our congregations. He's looking intensively to us and trying for his presence to be felt in our hearts. And he's looking and seeing who is really accepting those beautiful messages. And we're going to actually have much more in regards to this concept of the messages applying to us as we go over each message in the coming weeks. But I want you to understand, I want you to, to really grasp this principle that is important, that is necessary for us. We are to truly trust now more than ever that God has directed our steps, that God is telling us now that we are to have victory in this world. You see, Jericho is not just a city of the old time of the ancient times. Jericho is a symbol of the cities of this world, specifically of that large city of Babylon, a city that is, according to the Lord, fallen, fallen. Now, you may not see it fallen yet. Just like Jericho could not be seen destroyed when the Lord said, I assure you this city is destroyed, is fallen, is going to fall flat. The Lord is telling us the same thing, that Babylon, this great city in this world, the city that everyone wants to participate or partake of. And Babylon has infiltrated in every single aspect of our society. People are so caught up right now with education, with uh, careers, with having a comfortable home and a job. And all these things have been, unfortunately, tainted by the arms of Babylon. Education as a whole, for example, is a system that Babylon has implemented to try to persuade people to forget the word of God, to forget the Bible, to trust the science of this world over the science of God and his word. And this is why young people today from our own church are flocking by thousands outside of the church and leaving God's remnant church because education has been tinted, has been corrupted by Babylon. We have seen this happen more and more. Even our own doctrines right now are, are, are assaulted by the enemy, by those who have infiltrated their ideas of the world of Babylon into our church to think that we are no longer in need to have true victory, that we are no longer invited to overcome the world, that we can just walk in and be like the world, and yet the Lord says, that's not how it's going to work. That is not how my church is. My church is one that needs to have an independent understanding and an actual identity of themselves so that they are not deceived by the world and by Babylon. And so just like in Jericho that the Lord says that city is destroyed, will be destroyed, is going to fall flat, God has told us, has presented to us that the Babylon of this world, that whore, that sadly, that woman that is represented as Babylon, as this system that is corrupted, that is truly an abomination to the Lord, that city is already fallen before the eyes of the Lord. And for us and his people and his church, the victory over Babylon is guaranteed, is assured. But why is it that we don't have the victory? Why is it that we're not truly accepting the victory yet? We're, we're not seeing that happening simply because we have neglected to come to the Lord like Joshua did, to come humbly for God, to take away our perceived ideas of who the Lord is and realize we need to come before the presence of God and realize that we are called to humble ourselves, to fall at the feet of Jesus and to worship him, to remove the things that are going to tarnish that relationship with the Lord, like the feet, the sandals, the shoes that were symbols of dirt, of filthiness, the symbols that were, were connected to being dirty, to being in sin, the Lord is asking us that as we come before him, we put in our hearts a desire to put away 
the iniquity of our hearts. Notice what the Lord says in 1 John 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, this is 1 John 5 verse 1, whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, that begot loveth him, also that is begotten of him. Verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Notice here how the Lord speaks to us through John, that for us to be born of Christ, to, for us to be born of, of Jesus, we can actually have the love for him and love for our fellow men, for those that are in darkness, for those that are still in temptation, in sin. We can actually have the love of Christ in our hearts. And this is the key, the element for us to succeed in the victory. And that means that we are going to follow and fulfill that law of God in our hearts. We're going to keep his commandments. It's not, the, it's not separating ourselves from that aspect of commandment keeping. As a matter of fact, we're going to be like the Israelites in the Old Testament. We're going to have to follow every instruction of the Lord, and we will do it gladly. That experience of following the Lord, of understanding and accepting that Christ has given us his word, to receive instruction, to receive the knowledge of Christ, and to truly be transformed by that new birth experience, the power of Christ working in you, in my, in you and me, in our hearts, that is what the Lord is assuring us will give us victory. The victory that we can have in Christ, the way that we can overcome the world, that is only done today through our faith. Do you believe truly in Christ and his power to transform your life? Do you believe that he can give you instructions that are not going to be grievous, are not going to give, make you question what he's doing in your life, but actually going to say, Lord, thank you, because I am actually going to follow your instruction. I'm going to submit to your will, and whatever you say that is best for me, that I will do. I will ask you to help me not to question anymore. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to give up? What am I supposed to turn away from? Lord, you speak to my heart. You tell me I will follow. With that experience of faith, the Lord gives us the assurance that that is what overcomes the world. Our faith, that faith in the living power of Christ, in the living power of Jesus who gives us his grace to overcome. This is how we will start overcoming now and not wait till the battle is before us to truly say, oh, Lord, help us to overcome. We actually will have that experience even now, even then, and by then we will have the assurance that God and the Lord is with us. This is why I want you to read with me again in Revelation 1, 17 through 20. Notice how the Lord speaks to John and speaks to us as well. When I saw him, verse 17, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the golden in the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the seven angels of the churches, of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. See, in this experience, in these verses, the Lord is telling John and is telling you and me. If we have fall, fall to the Lord as dead, as realizing that we have anything, nothing to give him, that we are powerless against this battle that we have to face, the Lord tells us and gives us his right hand and gives us the assurance that in the same way that he can lift us up, he has in his right hand the churches. 
he's holding them in his right hand. He has those stars that are just the messages that are sent to the churches so that we can have that victory. And so when we actually receive those messages, we can actually understand that Christ is not trying to put us down, he's not trying to destroy, he's not trying to bring us to a sense of unworthiness, but actually he's trying to cleanse our lives and purify our lives to give us that victory in Christ Jesus. Have you, for example, experienced that victory today? Do you have in your heart that love for the Lord and for those that have hurt you, that have harmed you, that have wronged you, that have used you, that have abused you? Do you have the love of God in your heart for them or you have still resentment? You still have bitterness. You still don't want to look upon those that have done you harm. If that's the case, you are not far away from being transformed by the Lord because the Lord knows those things and knows your shortcomings and knows those feelings and knows what your heart is. And he's trying to tell you the way to overcome is through me. I understand betrayal. I understand abuse. I gave my life for those that hated me. And yet I love them and put my life for them. And this is why the Lord can give that transformation in our hearts and makes us like him. When we have that experience, the Lord can truly do great things for us and can truly give us the victory that he has promised. I would like to read to you what the Lord says through his spirit prophecy. This beautiful quote speaks to us today. It says in Patriots and Prophets, page 493, Paragraph 2, the following. God will do great things for those who trust in him. The reason why his professed people have no greater strength is that they trust so much to their own wisdom and do not give the Lord an opportunity to reveal his power in their behalf. He will help his believing children in every emergency if they will place their entire confidence in him and faithfully obey him. Dear friends, this is perhaps the promise that God wants us for you and for me to truly receive today. We may not experience the power of God because we do not trust him enough. We trust our own wisdom, our own understanding, or we may trust someone else, and I'm speaking of someone else, I'm speaking of a person, a particular individual, even a Christian leader or a pastor, we trust them more than we trust the word of God. We trust more our own understanding, our own knowledge, than we trust the Lord, the creator of all things. And because we trust the Lord less and we trust us more, we are not willing to follow his instructions. We're not willing to follow his commandments. We're not willing to follow his leading. But God's telling us, just like in the time of Jericho, that if we trust implicitly what he has said, if we trust completely in him and his direction, there will be no lost people. There will be no lost causes. There will be no one that can say, Lord, I did not make it. I was unable to overcome. I was hurt by the enemy. No, the Lord assures us, assures me and you that we can have that victory with Christ. And we can actually see the power in every emergency, in every opportunity that we need. So my dear friends today, I invite you to seek the Lord with all your heart, to put your trust in the Lord and to ask him to come into your heart today so that you may follow his instructions, follow his leading and know that he is a father a brother, a creator that can put in us his Holy Spirit, his power to overcome. Let us pray as we commit ourselves to the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we come before you at this hour, as we close today's presentation, this sermon, Lord, I pray that you will speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to truly give ourselves to you and be consecrated and be transformed by your power working in us. Help us to follow your instructions and to not question, but to be like Joshua, like John, willing to follow you and to fulfill your instructions as you know best. 
I pray for everyone watching, and I pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.